Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fielka. Today's May 17, 2023. We want to thank Rob Grant and his amazing podcast, I'm Probably Wrong About Everything. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with Piero Scarufi. Thank you, Piero. I really appreciate your time. Where are you calling in from? Thank you, man. I'm calling from near Stanford. First question is, what is the best thing for a human being? Uh, the best thing, uh, you have to qualify, the best thing to do, the best thing to think, the best thing to eat. I would say uh, on all my questions, you put them into the context you want. Okay, so the best uh, thing uh, <clears throat> I was, so I can... You know, if I think I can come up with more than one, but I would say because there's so much noise, I, I value silence these days. I think I value silence a lot. I think people are not used to, to silence anymore, to just be silent and, uh, and uh, listen uh, to the world. I hike a lot and when I hike, it's really enjoyable not to be talking, not to be surrounded by people who talk, and uh, to just uh, enjoy the universe, even better if it ends uh, after dark. And, uh, and you see the stars, and you realize how small and irrelevant all our chatter is, all our bickering is. Anyway, I don't want to get too philosophical. Yeah, no, that was beautiful. In fact, Thelonious Monk says, silence is the loudest sound in the universe. The uh, second the second question is, what is your favorite form of information, how it comes into you? Um, well, these days is, is a very good uh, question. I was just talking with a friend about how I started the website. I was telling him uh, <clears throat> how revolutionary it was for me uh, you're probably old enough to remember the Unix uh, um, groups. Yeah. Um, how revolutionary for me it was to get information from a computer, right? Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> fast forward to 2023, I'm not too happy with the information we get through computers. And so obviously social media become much worse probably much worse than the, the, print, the printed press was. I remember when as a young kid, I was criticizing marching in the street <clears throat> uh, against uh, the mainstream media. And now uh, I often miss them. So these days, if you talk about real information, I would say books written by scholars and lectures at, uh, um, universities like I'm, I'm luckily I live nearby near Stanford uh, where there are a lot of free lectures uh, so I would say if you talk about information but we have to be clear about the, the word information then I get them from books and uh, and scholars uh, if you're talking about just news that's a different story that's the scary part Let's let's stop. Let's stop there because that's why you answered the question in the first part. And eventually, down the line, we'll probably get into news a little. But just on reading for a second, did you become a reader one because your parents told you to? Two, they did it as an example or on your own? Uh, I would say on my own. My my parents were very poor; they couldn't buy me books. Um, my father um, loved revered literature but again we were too poor to buy books so i started buying them on my own uh, little by little and uh, reading a lot of them in libraries so why do you think humans collect or gather information that's uh <clears throat> knowledge I, I would say knowledge they gather knowledge uh, that's that's unique to human mind right i i don't think that uh um, other animals are so good at passing knowledge from one generation to the other. And that's probably why our life changes so much from one generation to the next one, because each generation thinks we learn something. 
um, I think it's uh, it's a human brain. Human brain does very strange things, you know. It's, yeah. uh, that does things that are totally unnatural viewed from the point of view of other animals. I always wonder how. I mean, when when uh, <clears throat> when uh, a, a cat looks at us, when a cow looks at us. Remember the comic strip that had the cows looking at humans? Yeah. Yes. Um, so what do they feel? What do they look? What do, what do we look like to them? Our brain is very weird. So one thing we do, we accumulate knowledge. We like to write it down. <clears throat> we are proud that we have knowledge. We are proud of the people who have knowledge and so on. It's one of the weird things to do, you know? Yeah. it's uh, You're anticipating all the questions. Thank you so much because is this need or want to collect information more innate or more invented? No, no, I think I think it comes from the human brain. Human brain does weird things. I mean, um, uh, just just think of uh, all the rituals we invented, things of the religions we invented. The human brain does weird things. And one of the weird things that it does, we want to learn. We want to learn how the universe works. We want to learn quantum mechanics, relativity. We want to learn yeah. a lot of things, a lot of mathematics that we, we will never use. And still, we want to know it. Yeah. Do thoughts create emotions? Well, I think emotions also create thoughts. I think they go together. Yeah. Fill in the blank. I don't know what I think until I... Um, until I write it down. Yeah. Well, that's what Joan Didion said. McLuhan says, I don't know what I think until I say it. Joan Didion said, I don't know what I think until I write it. Can humans think without language? Yeah, I, I think so. Although, see, I hesitate because the question is a little misleading. I don't think you can have a human that doesn't, a human brain that doesn't develop some form of language will not speak a language like English, uh, French, Italian. We have so many grammatical rules, uh, exceptions, and so on. But I suspect the human brain always produces a language. So, Yeah, that's good. And that's really the <clears throat> this whole series is about me and you versus the wording on the questions. I'm for, you know, restating them, getting feedback from you, like you saying that's a misleading question. That's really important for me to hear. So don't hold back. Chomsky says a language is not just words. It's culture, a tradition, a unification of community, a whole history that creates what a community is. What do you do when language doesn't work? When language breaks down, what do you do? Yeah, so first of all, yeah, then I, I think Chomsky, Chomsky is, is uh, <clears throat> I, I agree with Chomsky <clears throat> on, uh, on a lot of things, in particular on this one. Um, language is uh, imperfect. Uh, that's another mystery, you know. Animals are actually very precise. Uh, somebody in uh, I was in Myanmar, I think. Uh, somebody who was studying birds told me that that bird uh, emits, I think, thirty-six sounds, whatever. And he told me each sound was a very precise information. Like there's a big animal coming from that direction at this speed, and so on. And instead, we humans use these very long sentences, organizing very long paragraphs. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's all ambiguous, right? It's all confusing. <laughs> um, so that's another thing that our brain does. I, when I say that we do weird things, I didn't say we do wonderful things. It just yeah. our brain does weird things. Yeah. So we evolved this language. Incidentally, I, I, I have come to believe the language evolved so much, it became so complex because we humans learned how to cheat at an incredible degree. So animals, yeah. some animals are good at cheating other, I mean, fe fellow uh, uh, animals, but we are so good at this. And language is really the powerful weapon we have to 
for deceit, for, uh, uh, for misleading others. And I know it sounds very pessimistic, but if you think of it, uh, if I just have to tell you what is the capital of France, I don't need a very elaborate language. Yeah. So this elaborate language, in my opinion, unfortunately was born for a negative thing. And when we have laws and when we try to force people to be honest, in a sense, we try to limit what they can do with language, if you think of it. Yeah. You know, it's a little pessimistic, but anyway, the human no, brain does weird things. I think you're sussing out things beautifully. You're very articulate and I appreciate it. On what occasion do you lie? Uh, hopefully never. I make a lot of mistakes. Um, do I deliberately lie? Um, maybe, I hope she's not listening. Maybe I lied to my wife a couple of times because those were things that would hurt her. So I could lie to avoid pain in yeah. somebody. But I hope, I, I mean, since I was a kid, I, lying it was not my, one of my concerns. What I write is what I think. What I say yeah. is what I think. Your observations yeah. of humans in general, are we more thinking beings or more feeling beings? The vast majority feeling probably including me. I, I I pretend to be more of a thinking being, but I think the vast majority of us is so much driven by feelings uh, that it's really difficult to stop and think, was that guy really wrong? Was that thing really, is that thing really so bad that, that I hate it so much? So I think, I think well, unfortunately, we're mostly feeling. And, and then there are some great philosopher scientists who can go beyond the emotion, blah, blah, maybe. Yeah, very good. Two questions from Alan Turing in 1950s. One, is thinking a function of the soul? Uh, yeah, you have to, to define soul. I hate to sound like Socrates, but first you define things, then I can have an opinion. Um, if, if soul means brain, then yes. But if soul means something divine, then, then I don't know what it is. Second Turing question is, can machines think? <sighs> Again, I hate to sound like Socrates, but you have to define think. Uh, as you know, right now we have this chat GDP that you can talk to and it will talk back. <clears throat> and when I use it, I play tricks. I try to prove that it's not so intelligent. My wife <clears throat> uses it for very uh, mundane things like fix my fix my report. And uh, she says, thank you. And ChatGPT replies, uh, you're welcome. So, you know, define thinking. Uh, it's, uh, uh, again, if you're implying emotions, then I, I don't think ChatGPT has emotions. Um, but uh, the, we get into into really philosophical terrain here. What is thinking? Reasoning. I mean, at this point, you cannot deny the machines reason, right? Because they can solve very complicated uh, mathematical problems. So, do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? Uh, definitely not happiness. I don't think what I have done in my life made me happy. Occasionally, it makes me proud of myself because I do some things. Uh, not for money, just because I think they're right, but I don't think it has given me happiness. So I think most of what I do is actually just because my brain likes adventure, actually. Beautiful words, adventure. Does the brain more detect consciousness or create it? Like, is consciousness there bubbling away and we're more so detecting it or more so creating it? Yeah, I wish I knew where consciousness is. Uh, we assume it's in the brain, somewhere in the brain. So that would answer your question. But nobody has found it yet. We haven't yeah. found a place in the brain that, ah, that's where Piero's consciousness is. So I really don't know. What's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? Speed of light. The poet Audre Lorde said you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Yvonne Rayner, colleague, responded and said you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? 
Hmm. I don't know, I like artists. I think artists come up with the excellent answers to these kind of questions. They're yeah. very good at, uh, right now they're very good at using new technology to do things for which that technology was not invented at all. So I would probably call some of my <clears throat> artist friends and ask them. I Unfortunately, I don't have that degree of creativity but I tend to agree that you can use those tools to demolish the master's house. Beautiful. What new toy do you suggest? Uh, toys that bring, I mean, toys for children. Uh, I would say toys that bring back children to nature. I, I think, I, I mean, I grew up playing soccer in the, in the street of my neighborhood and um, and uh, and the ball was often made of paper we would just put paper together with scotch tape and uh, and uh, and kick it and um, I think I learned a lot just by just by playing very simple games with very simple toys what do you worry about when you go to bed at night uh, well, maybe either it's because I'm getting old or because the world is really messed up. But these days, I really worry about uh, about let's call it geopolitics, which involves U.S. politics, but also what's happening in uh, other continents. Uh, so that's uh, I think I think I, I wasn't this worried previously in my life, even during the Cold War. So these days, I'm worried about. Um, about uh, uh, politics, basically. But, yeah. you know, I mean, if you go back a few years, that wouldn't have been my main concern. These days it is. Yeah. <clears throat> McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound, the poet, that artists are the antenna of the race. They're broadcasting and detecting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions. So we might learn how to cope with what we don't like about our inventions. So I ask you the question Marshall probed his whole career. Why do we ignore the hidden psychic effects of our inventions, even though the artists are broadcasting them to us? Well, artists are not easy to understand. <clears throat> Most artists that we uh, revere today and study in school were not considered great artists by... Uh, contemporary uh, society. So <clears throat> think of Dante, Scient um, Shakespeare, um, you can name a lot of them. Um, so that's one That's one simple reason. It takes time to appreciate, fully appreciate what an artist was trying to say. And probably we never understand it. Well, one beauty, probably what is most intriguing about art is that it, it, it has no... Um, mathematical meaning that's yeah. it's, it, i mean and you know it's it's uh mostly up to interpretation and each age interpret it in a different way but it's important one of the things you said that i agree with that artists are often the real social scientists you know we have sociologists yeah. anthropologists that study society and i think that art is really um a very powerful tool uh, to discover a uh, society. Just just think of rock music. I know you're also into rock music. I mean, if you want to study a society of the United States in the 60s, uh, you can read a lot of books, but at the end of the day, you just listen to rock music. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you will get a much better picture. Yeah, I agree. And I appreciate all your writing on it. It's been enlightening. And it's funny because Thelonious Monk said musicians are mathematicians. <laughs> so it's sort of a flip. But um, do artists have moral obligation? My friend, uh, we all have moral obligations. Um, and then, then we don't follow them. Uh, a lot of the things we say and do, starting from the day you vote, um, has, should have moral obligations. So yes, artists too. Artists too, but precisely because art is so difficult to interpret, and uh, I, I don't know how you would uh, talk to an artist and say 
your moral obligation is what? Not yeah. to show naked people, and then we cancel all Michelangelo. And uh, <clears throat> my wife was amazed when we walked around Paris and there were all these naked women on these palaces. So yes, everybody's moral obligations, but I don't, I don't know what the rule is. Yeah. Well put. Are you more afraid of new ideas or more afraid of old ideas? Oh, old ideas. Yeah. Can you conjure up your earliest memory ever or one of them? Of, of uh, an old idea or new idea? No, no, not idea. Your memory. Do, do you have, can you tell me or conjure up your earliest memory of your of you in, in the world or one of those earliest memories? I don't know. When I was... Um... I don't know if it was, if it's the oldest, I remember being in a thunderstorm, a very, I mean, two, three years old, and there was a thunderstorm, but I don't know if it's the oldest one. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? Well, I think blessing, but that's because uh, I have memory. Uh, so if you, if you live the, on another planet and look at planet Earth, and then it would be interesting to decide uh, from up there, is memory a blessing or a curse for this planet? Uh, <laughs> That's good to step away and mm. think about things. I appreciate that. Tell me someone within your immediate family and then outside your immediate family, just briefly, who had an impact on you, kind of like a role model. And what specifically was that impact? Well, my father was, uh, <clears throat> let's say, a difficult man. Um, but, you know, he was a prisoner of war during, you know, people who were not good fascists were sent to prison camps in Germany. So it was one of them. And so that <clears throat> certainly had an influence. And then, as I said, he liked literature. So it probably influenced my passion for reading books. Uh, would I consider him a role model? No, I lived a life very different, with different values. So in my immediate family, honestly, um, I can't think, I can think of someone. Um, if I leave my family, I've had several role models. As some of them, people I met briefly, you know, I met this guy in uh, Brazil, I think. Uh, he was building something for tourists. His town didn't, didn't have tourists. Tourists were coming by to see the, the big waterfalls. And he was building something for tourists. And I asked him was paying him. And said that nobody's paying me. So why are you building it? And, uh, and he said that because tourists who come here don't have a place to shelter from the, from the sun. <clears throat> he didn't even tell me I'm building it so that my future generations will have more tourists. They were just thinking that tourists deserve a place to, tourists are complete strangers, right? So sometimes people like this I meet in my travels. I don't know if you know that I travel a lot. I've been, I've been to more than 160 countries. And some of these people just um, tell me things, maybe because they live with, with such different values, you know, in such different societies. So some of them I would consider... And then role models, of course, are a lot of great philosophers and scientists. Did your parents raise you a particular religion? Uh, I, no. <clears throat> My mom was uh, <clears throat> devout uh, Catholic. <clears throat> My father was not, probably because of World War II. You know, the, the Catholic Church uh, was close to Mussolini. And uh, so I didn't ask, but I think my father had problems with the Catholic Church. So the answer is no. Do you pray? No. If God exists, what would you like God to say to you after you die? So here we are we're assuming that God, if it exists, is somebody who talks to you. And <laughs> so so you see, that's why I don't believe in God, because when I whenever I ask who is God, they always give me this impression of some kind <laughs> of uh, some kind of king, you know. <laughs> uh, that's uh, so 
But anyway, if, if I'm dead and I meet, let's say I meet Buddha, which is more credible, okay? okay. So Buddha is not supposed to be immortal, omnipotent, or whatever. It's just supposed to be a very wise man. Uh, so when I meet him, it would be nice if he says, Piero, there's one thing I really liked about you. And I don't know what it is, but it would be great if he tells me there's one thing that he likes about me. That is a beautiful, thank you for answering it in those terms. That's a beautiful answer. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Oh, that's, that's probably a better question than, than you think. Uh, because, <laughs> especially these days. I mean, because evil is really spread around the cloud. <clears throat> these days you have uh, uh, evil creates itself. You know, evil is becoming the algorithms <clears throat> that drive things. <clears throat> So, I don't know, if you go back, maybe evil always existed. It's this thing that is hard to quantify. Because if you, if you go back a thousand years, two thousand years, maybe even ten thousand years, people were doing stupid things, killing each other, um, based on gossip, based on strange beliefs, uh, based on religion, which in my opinion is superstition. Um, today, they do silly things based on things they read on uh, on social media, uh, which is driven by algorithms. What you see, it's not like there's somebody who wants you to read that thing. There's an algorithm that is designed, by the way, to maximize profit. Yeah. And indirectly, it presents you with things that make you very angry or, or make you do you know, fake news that make you do completely completely evil things so maybe this evil does exist so god maybe i don't think it exists but uh, in, in a sense the devil does put it this way piero that was very good and you know the hidden question really is is how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy and i'll set it up alan watts says if you acknowledge your enemy you empower them Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK says, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. The basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you respond to Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, so first of all, I think you have to know your enemy. So I watch uh, that now I don't want to get into politics, but I watch uh, almost every night a TV <coughs> show that uh, I hate. Now I don't watch it anymore because they kick the guy out. Uh, but <coughs> you have to know your enemy. Um, so I think that's important. And in some cases, this is helpful to understand that the enemy was not so bad. In some other cases, uh, it's important to understand that why the enemy, what what is making the enemy powerful. Like you know, I still I still don't know why. I still understand why Putin invaded Ukraine. As much as I read the, all these experts, uh, that is a problem. If we really don't know the enemy so well, um, we do have a problem. Now, Fellini said something interesting. You said Fellini said that he needs an enemy. Uh, that's yeah. actually interesting. Because um, if you think of it, if everybody agrees with me and everybody's nice with me, what's my motivation to, to do or say anything? So that's sort of interesting. I'm not sure I would really like to have enemies who hate me, uh, but people who disagree with me, that's probably a good point. You know, you're a good listener because, you know, I sort of throw on all these cute quotes sometimes before the question. And especially on that one, there's like four of them. And, you know, people get overloaded like the next step. But I appreciate you listening because that is a bear. You know, it's almost like I, I leave this one out too. Walt Whitman, I no doubt deserve my enemies. <laughs> Ah, it's a good one. That's that good is one. That, that is like almost reinforcing. But here's here's more. To, Nassim Talib says games were created to give non-heroes 
the illusion of winning. In real life, we don't know who wins or loses, but we can tell who a hero is. Someone responded to that quote by saying, villains don't think they're bad. They want control. Heroes want freedom. And Gregory Bateson said, when the criminal gets caught, does he go, oh, my criminal skills weren't up to snuff that day? Or does he go, I did something morally and socially wrong? So again, it's a lot of prompts. You can go wherever you like. But the question is, does punishment work? Oh, I'm not sure I understand how the question fits with the... With the well, point. yeah, it, it, does, it goes all over the place. So you can just leave the question out and respond to this thing about, you know, um, Nassim Tlaib saying, you know, we don't know who wins or loses, but we can tell a who a hero is. It's sort of more in that regard. What is the function of her he be heroism? Well, first of all, in our days, we are, we are, uh, heroism is rapidly fading away. Uh, if you remember in the 60s and the 70s, there were heroes. There were people, I don't know, saving children or doing something. Yeah. And uh, now it's really hard to have a hero, the moment he does something good, uh, he gets disparaged in social media, conspiracy theories, who knows? So, um, anyway, um, <clears throat> I think a lot of heroes were accidental heroes, by the way. I, I don't think uh, uh, many people plan to be a hero. Um, so, I think... Um, I think so when you play games i'm not sure about this story that a game can create a hero um i i tend to think when i think of heroes i tend to think more of sports uh, why we like sports <clears throat> why sports are so popular um and i think one reason is number one we feel they're more honest you know if a politician become president it doesn't mean he's the best person in the country typically it's not but if somebody wins the, 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 the gold medal at the Olympic Games, most likely he is really the fastest running in the world. And second, these people in sport become heroes. And so that's interesting to think why we idolize somebody, for example, in soccer, who kicks the ball very well. What's so special about running around the field, chasing a ball and kicking it? Um, is, so it's interesting to think of that. And, and, and somehow that, I think, relates to heroes, but I'm not smart enough to tell you how. Yeah. But then you could say maybe the opposite or another flip of hero is villain. So if we say a villain, you know, you're, you're smart knowing is know your enemy. So know your villain. Then what do you do? with the enemy or the villain is punishment a route do you think it works or is there other means to resolve basically it's what's the best means of conflict resolution or what is a means of conflict resolution for you so in an ideal world you just show the members of society that he's a villain if he's a villain it remains a villain it can be a villain Typically, he has the support of society. Yeah. Otherwise, he would just be excluded, kicked out, for example, kicked out of politics. If he's not kicked out of politics, it means he's still getting millions of votes. Yeah. So the issue now is why those millions of people vote in that way. Yeah. So I think the, the, the number one priority should be to, number one, you have to make sure he's really a villain, you, yourself, and then yeah. show to the rest of society is a villain. So somehow we have to isolate, exclude him, expel him. Punishment, I'm not sure that helps as much as we think. I've always been uh, torn about the issue of prisons and definitely opposed to capital punishment. Yeah, this um, you are opposed to capital punishment. Is that what you said? Yeah, I agree. In the, you know, the New York Times uh, TV critic was talking about cable news business model. He said conflict means urgency and urgency means the viewer glued to the channel. It's a machine designed to generate stress and negative emotion. And then he says humankind's most productive state 
the fight or flight response. What is humankind's most productive state, in your opinion? Most productive state. Yeah. So we're like, what is the human condition in another way? Is con I, I'm I'm still working on the wording on that question. Is conflict the human condition? Well, there's a part of me who thinks so. Um yeah. because I'm the pessimist, right? I think a lot of the things that we a lot of the things that created the thing we call society uh, actually originate from uh, competition cheating you know it's uh, that's part of our brain our brain is so yeah. powerful in many uh, evil ways yeah. so there's a part of me that thinks that conflict uh uh he's is one of the things that the at the the foundation the foundation of our civilization but when you ask uh, about the, the most productive state, I immediately started to think of civilizations. Because, you know, that's that's somebody from another planet looks down and he sees that uh, that uh, squirrels always do the same things and lions always do the same things. But humans, oh my God, you know, they used to build pyramids and then they started building skyscrapers and now they build uh, artificial intelligence and so on. So, so the humans are very productive at creating civilizations and perfect lead in thank you james joyce was the first projectionist in dublin 100 years ago he basically checked out he said this is stupid why should i go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when i can go outside and see a real tree years later faulkner said sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism why do we have to recreate things in order to get them why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life, why don't we just live life? So the answer to Joyce <clears throat> is that not everybody is a tree. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, originally, the, the very early movies, a lot of them were just theatrical theatrical plays. I mean, originally, it was yeah. only a few minutes long, but you couldn't physically have that actress in every single town of the world, so the movie allowed that. Um, what did Faulkner say? Faulkner said sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Okay, so that I doubt. That I disagree. I think that, uh, first, first of all, a lot of writers, including him, took inspiration from, uh, from news, from what was happening in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the real world. And second, I think the reason that uh, news are still, are still so popular that we still watch news on TV, on social media, is because they are so incredibly um, unpredictable. So it's uh, I'm not sure that uh, that fiction can beat what happens in real life. Uh, what happens tomorrow in your neighborhood? If 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 you see cops in your neighborhood tomorrow, it will probably be something totally unpredictable that you did not expect. Yeah. And I'm not sure how many writer, writers can write a novel like that. Yeah. Very good. You know, um, tell me just briefly and walk us through your career path. What did you study in, in uh, college? And I'm curious, what specifically was your tipping point? I know you were pursuing math. What's your tipping point? I want to pursue math. And then your tipping point, I want to be a writer. I'm going to write. So first of all, if we go back to high school, in high school, I was not famous for math. <clears throat> I was famous for writing. I was writing these very long essays. I still remember. I, I, I finished, I think, uh, twice a second in a European context for uh, essays. So I was sort of a legend in my high school for the length of my essays, not necessarily for the quality, but definitely I was writing a lot. You know, other, the other kids were writing one page, I was writing 10 pages, something like that. But what kicked, what kicked you over to being a writer then? What did you, what was the tipping point go, I'm going to write? I was just good at it. That's, yeah. that's the honest truth. The other, the other kids had trouble writing one page for me, it was so easy to write 10 pages. Okay. Yeah. 
and then when I when I finished high school, I I, I enrolled in math um, because I think there was something mythical about mathematics uh, that, that there wasn't it wasn't there about the literature. I think it was I, I I had both choices available. I was I was good at both, and then from math, <clears throat> actually also studied physics. My my thesis was. Uh, was all in uh, in physics, and uh, my my supervisor Tulio Reggio was a famous uh, scientist. He, he was briefly in Princeton, um, Einstein's uh, university. Anyway, so I studied relativity with uh, my supervisor. Was definitely not a role model for me, but he was influential because he showed me how uh, dumb I am. This guy was an incredible mathematical physicist. He could write formulas so difficult in one second and solve problems. And, you know, I, I would spend two weeks trying to solve the problem. I cannot solve, solve it. I go to his office, he looks at it, and in five minutes, solved. So it, it definitely showed me my limitations. So it was very influential in that sense. So anyway, then I studied physics. Then somebody, then I was already writing code, software, because in, in those days, if you had a degree in math, um, there was a new career, writing software. So I, uh, this was in Italy. So an Italian corporation tried to hire me repeatedly. And I said no, because I didn't like the idea of working for a big company. Eventually, they offered me <coughs> a job at their California R&D lab. And I saw that as a, as a vacation. Uh, those were the days of uh, early punk rock, new wave. And so for me, it was just a chance to go to San Francisco and Los Angeles and experience it in, uh, in person. And then I got into artificial intelligence uh, just because it was, uh, it was interesting. And uh, so I was doing AI uh, in the mid late eighties uh, when nobody cared. So that's, that's, at the same time, I kept writing. <clears throat> so the website was officially born, I don't remember, 92, 95. Um, at the same time, I was at Stanford doing research on AI. They had, uh, they had one of the early browsers. So as I was writing, I was putting things on, uh, on the web without having any clue that someday this World Wide Web would be such a big deal. So the two things went, went on in parallel. You know? When did you start writing poetry? What was the tipping point to write poetry? Oh, very, very young. Uh, definitely as a teenager. And in Italy, I won uh, one uh, poetry prize after the other. Not big ones, but national, national contest. So big enough. So I was encouraged by, um, by the feedback I was getting from people. You know? Do you still write poetry? Yeah. I write long, convoluted poems, but these days I don't know anybody who reads poetry, so I'm, I don't even post them anymore. A screenwriting teacher told me great art is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. Great art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. When you're writing one of your books, an essay or poetry, what role does intention play in your creative process? So if I'm writing, it depends, because if I'm writing poetry, there's no intention. It's, well, it's philosophical intention. I see, I see poetry as philosophy, by the way. My favorite poets are people like Eliot, uh, Pessoa, <clears throat> people uh, who to me are philosophers. Um, when I write a book on artificial intelligence, I, I wrote a history of Silicon Valley. Um, I wrote a history of rock music. So in that case, there is obviously an intention. The intention is to, first of all, write a book that people haven't written. I think my books have their own, otherwise I don't write the book. They have their own original take on, uh, on the subject. And the, the intention is, is indirectly, the intention is to convince the reader, right? That, that I'm right. That's the next question, actually, Pierre. <clears throat> Duchamp said there's no art without an audience. How much are you thinking of your reader when you're writing? 
um, a lot, I think. Um, I don't necessarily focus on not what my audience will be. In fact, my audience typically is always somebody, it's always people I didn't expect. Uh, but <clears throat> yes, they are, my books are written for an audience. Incidentally, some of my books were born as the reader of the classes I was teaching at UC Berkeley. So the audience was pretty obvious. It was my students. Yeah. McLuhan says everything we invent extends some humanness, like knife and fork extends our teeth. Shutter and a camera extends our eyelid. Maybe philosophy or religion extends uh, 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 consciousness, you know, non-tangible. What does the writing utensil extend for you? What humanness, whether it's a pen or a keyboard? Oh, the first thing would be memory, my memory, my own memory. Yeah. A lot of people tell me, you wrote this. I don't even remember writing it. But then when yeah. I hear it, oh, my God, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I agree with myself. Surprise. Um, so the first thing would be memory. It, uh, I mean, writing to me, it was invented to extend uh, human memory. McLuhan says there's no such thing as a good or a bad movie. It's a good or a bad viewing experience. So it could go into your writing as a music writer or film. Yeah, I disagree, of course. I, th I think there are bad movies are just bad movies. And of course, yeah. these are always very subjective uh, definitions. And uh, <clears throat> I have found that... Uh, the viewing experience has to be defined because I think it's viewing experience uh, in, as in experience, as in uh, all the things you have seen before. So not the experience today is how much have you experienced of rock music? How much have you experienced of cinema? And yeah. when I uh, compare my notes with people who have heard as much as me, viewed as much as me, Guess what? The differences are not so big. <clears throat> you know, of course, everybody's is favorites. And luckily, thank God, we have different opinions. Uh, but guess what? You converge more than you diverge. The big, the big differences are with people who haven't had so much experience of past cinema, past music, art, whatever. Then the difference can be colossal. And... To me, the explanation is very simple. You know, you heard only those 10, 15 things. Unfortunately, I heard thousands of things. And so, of no. course, we have this gap. You know, let's see when you hear 1,000, how you feel. Yeah. We're going to get into music more, but I have to just salute you. Bravo for putting <clears throat> Captain Beefheart trout mass replica is the greatest rock album of all time you know I, I had the fortune of him calling me 52 times in the year of 1991 once a week in the middle of the night <laughs> and um it was very special and uh to have that album that high up is amazing and just I sort of specialize in the history of funk music and to see your top funk was P funk. I've asked George Clinton all these same questions in the meters. That was just like this guy is nailing it for me, you know, beautifully in in list making. I like list, but it's just stay on cinema for a couple more minutes. Peter Greenaway said cinema is much too rich a medium to be left to storytellers. Are experimental filmmakers telling stories a different way or doing something completely different? Like if me and you watch Tony Conrad's The Flicker, which is 15 minutes of black and white just flickering back and off, off and on, we don't necessarily, we could have a story go through our head, but it's not necessarily what's defined as narrative or storytelling. So any, yeah, any comments on that? Yeah. Yeah, so that, so Peter Greenway probably wrote that a long time ago. Uh, today, uh, he would be even more skating uh, because not only, at least mainstream uh, cinema, not only is in the hands of storytellers, but they keep telling the same story. I mean, yeah. we live in the, in the age of the sequel, uh, yeah, the sequel yeah. of the sequel, and the sequel of the sequel of the sequel. 
Um, so that's uh, even from a purely narrative point of view, um, it's it's um, amazingly poor in my opinion. Um, at the same time, you must admit experimental cinema, whatever that means, has disappointed. If I compare what happened in the visual arts, I mean the painting or whatever came after painting, painting sculpture, and then you know what is now digital art, with what happened in uh, in the cinema in the video, um, I'm personally disappointed. I don't see the same kind of creativity. I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen uh, the the Duchamp, the uh, even the Jackson Pollock of uh, of videos so so maybe yeah. maybe cinema is at the end of the day storytelling i don't know although it can be yeah. more or less trivial of course peter greenway was telling stories he just was telling stories in a little unusual uh way yeah he actually said um if cinema is this long you know now it's about 130 years old and in literature is this old nothing has come close if Finnegan's Wake is the pinnacle of literature. Nothing's come close in the way of cinema. He says, Marty Scorsese ain't doing anything different than D.W. Griffith did. They're just filming plays. So what? They do a little different camera movement or whatever. But um, I appreciate this because I actually asked, thank you for listening so closely. <clears throat> and being articulate. I asked Michael Apted about 40 years ago, why do rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? Most people don't know. Abel Gantz invented rapid montage in 1922 in France, but in the 80s, it flourished with MTV to the point where Marty Scorsese said, I cut my films faster because of MTV. Well, Michael Abdid said, we, we've learned to take in information faster. So my question is asked with a bias. Can we literally learn to take in information faster or we just brainwash to believe we can? Hmm. Interesting. So I think the brain, the human brain has a limited capacity. But, <clears throat> but of course, if you only... So I think it's probably an illusion. <clears throat> it's probably yeah. an illusion. Um, yeah, the human brain has a limited capacity. I think if you show me many, many, many things, I will absorb them, but I will miss a lot of details. If you show me only a tree, uh, I will count the leaves. You know, so so it's probably an illusion. Um, Is it literally brain, possible to multitask? To do what? Is it literally possible to multitask? Well, it's possible. And the question is what is what you miss. So I multitask a lot. Uh, my life has been multitasking. But the number one criticism I get is that the quality is low on all the things I do. <laughs> and, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't let you bo that bother you, dude. You are doing a lot of good me, for the world. Let me finish. And I agree. <laughs> and I agree. Good, good. So, it's, uh, so, it is, so it is possible, uh, but you miss something. You always miss something because, again, I think that the, the, there's a limited capacity. So, yeah. Um, so, Abel Gans, you said 1922. I'm, I'm taking notes because I, I want to double check. So, I think uh, one simple reason why there was this evolution in editing is that. They wanted to tell longer stories, right? Yeah. So it was still about storytelling, except they decided, I don't want, I want to cut some things. I don't have to show every single detail. Yeah. And, and you know, I can fast forward and show you yeah. three years, a story of three years in one yeah. hour. Yeah. So, you know, that's, I think that's, uh, that's all, almost a natural evolution of the idea of storytelling in, uh, in cinema. Yes. In fact, Hollis Frampton, great experimental filmmaker, said, narrative is born among the animal necessities of the spirit because we're waiting to die. Wow. Can, you, can you forget to die? Oh, I don't think. I think every single day we are aware uh, that we're mortal. 
Uh, in fact, I think psychologists underestimate uh, there's an age at which a child realizes not only people die, you will die. And, and I've never re read something from a psychologist that analyzes that moment, the moment you realize you are mortal. And I think then when your parents die, that really hits you very hard because when your own mother, your own father die, that's when you really realize I'm next. So I think that's with us since we are children and it's sitting in the back there. And then sometime comes more to the foreground. Sometimes we try to push it back in the background, but I think it's very much, very much a powerful um, element of the human condition. What was the motive of the cave artist? Um, yeah, that would be very interesting. Um, I've seen some of this uh, cave art and uh, you really wonder, <clears throat> were the, was there a message, number one? Number, no, number two, was it just done by children who were playing? Uh, unfortunately, we're not there, so, but it would be fascinating to be there and see, uh, was it really art or it, or it had a meaning? Um, that's, uh, I don't have an answer. Let's go into music a little because your essays on music are intriguing. I really appreciate them. What's the function of music? The original function, hmm. See, the function today has changed. The original function <clears throat> thousands of years ago. Hmm. I don't know. I, I suspect that music was not separated from uh, dancing and poetry, but I cannot prove it. Uh, the function today, I think, I think keeps changing, really. I mean, the function of jazz music was not the function of rock music. I think rock music was an international language. It, it was, uh, if, you, if, you, if you go back in the 60s, there were no social media. Uh, if, if you were printing something, it was, uh, as you know, black and white paper distributed to the people around you. But rock music was international. It was all over the world, at least the Western world. So I think uh, rock music had a, had a function that went way beyond uh, uh, the, the, the notes. Uh, I don't think jazz music had the same thing. The jazz music was more about the mood of a community and the mood of a more limited society. And the function of music today, wildly more commercial, wildly more commercial starting with, I don't know who, but at some point, definitely with Madonna, it becomes so visual. You know, you cannot separate the, the star from the, from the video. So, so I, think, I think the function really changed over, over the ages. My friend says the three T's of music are technique, theory, and taste. Technique, you can learn how to play the guitar. Theory, you can know what chords. How does one acquire taste? I think by listening. My taste has been shaped by, by thousands and thousands of albums, literally thousands. At one point, I had uh, more than 10,000. 10, 10, um, so by listening, yeah. McLuhan says song is slowed down speech. The reason cultures have different musical taste is ultimately connected to language difference. Any comment? Uh, I tend to disagree these days because, <clears throat> and I'm not saying this because I'm happy about it, but as I travel around the world, I started noticing the incredible appeal of Western music in particular Western dance, let's call it electronic dance pop. Uh, yeah. I still remember when this, uh, this guy in India, highly educated uh, self-taught philosopher <clears throat> was telling me about the difference between Indian music and Western music. Um, if he's still alive, if his dad is rolling his grave, uh, if he's still alive, it must be very sad because as I tr travel through India, I hear there commercial music and it's not it's not difficult different at all from uh, our electronic dance pop but it is very different from the music that he 
was trying to teach me uh, 20, 30 years ago. And same with China. I mean, uh, mainstream Chinese music is is really almost uh, a, a Chinese language version of, of uh, Western uh, pop music. So I, I'm not so sure that the taste is so different. It's just that uh, until recently, different places uh, were more insulated. They couldn't hear other other kinds of music. I'm not I'm not so sure. I'm not I'm not so sure about this. That taste can be so different, and I'm not sure language has any influence because you know I grew up in a continent. How many languages we have in Europe? I mean, what's the difference between Italian, French, German uh, music? So I don't think yeah. so. Uh, even less so in classical music where you can have Chopin. And if I don't tell you where he was born and where he lived, you probably wouldn't guess unless you know. Yeah. Right. What's more fundamental, language or music? Hmm. Uh, define music. Yeah, <laughs> very good. But, but the fact that I hesitate tells you that I see them as both inevitable, uh, inevitable outcomes of the human brain. Yeah. Nay, tell me an instrumental that makes you laugh. Instrumental. No words, an instrumental uh, song that makes you laugh. See, the first one that comes to mind, it's interesting because I haven't heard it in a long time. Um, what, what was the name of the band? The Bonzo. Bonzo Dog Do Dog. Dog. Yeah, Dog Do Band, whatever. Uh, they have a song at the end of the album that is just two minutes of laughing. I don't know if you remember it. Oh, I love it. That's a great example. But actually, it doesn't make me laugh. It, it's sort of sad when you. Think, <laughs> you, you know, they were they were the 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 the, the, the comedians of rock music. Um, but actually, those two minutes of just laughing at the end of a of an album that is all uh, comic uh, skits. Uh, actually, it's, it sounds very sad. So I wouldn't say it's a. So probably something by Frank Zappa. Yeah. Well, what, very good. What What is the function of laughter? Hmm. Yeah, we laugh even if we are alone, so it's not communication. Um, yeah, it's uh, maybe... Uh, I, I actually suspect it could be something very profound. It could be a way that our brain recognizes... Uh, uh, there's something very unique here, and uh, somehow that's important to notice. Yeah, Gurdjieff says laughter is the reconciliation of yes and no. But McLuhan loved to quote Steve Allen, behind every joke there's a grievance. Any thought on that? And I don't like the word every, but behind jokes there's a grievance. Any thought on that? No, I, that that doesn't strike me as true. I think behind every joke, there's some kind of uh, uh, some kind of uh, reasoning. I, reasoning. I see, yeah, I see it much more uh, interesting. Um, a joke, uh, a joke tells you something your brain wasn't expecting. That's why you laugh. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I just I saw that, that it's a, it's amazing as you ask questions, the most stupid things come to mind. But when you were talking about laughter, I I, I somehow <clears throat> I remembered an episode. After. I'm getting all them digressing, but I was at post office. There's a, a line of people, and one of the women in line picks up the phone, and then she shouts, "My house is on fire! Oh my god!" And she runs out. And guess what? We all started laughing. Why would you do that? <laughs> of course, we didn't do it intentionally. Right. Why humans? Why you must do that? Something horrible is happening. You yeah. start laughing. Yeah. So it tells me that the laughter is not related to good slash bad. It's related to the, something so unexpected. Something. Uh, by the way, something that could happen to me. I don't know. There's something in laughter that actually that? has a cognitive value. 
It's very good. It, my friend says, when you're laughing, you're learning. But it is amazing that everybody cracked up because it was almost like a skit from Saturday Night Live. They She runs out and everybody goes, ha, ha, ha. But but you know, now I notice this. So many cases, you say something, something bad happens in front of you and your first reaction is to laugh or your second reaction when you tell yeah. your friend what happened. It's, you say it as if, was something funny, but it wasn't. It was something really bad, you know? Well, I think that's laughter is a release. Most people, they'll say, when I say, what's yeah. the function of laughter? They'll say it's a release. But, you know, there's a there's a line here we can follow the thread is, I asked my friend who wrote comedy with Robin Williams, Ken that's the job of satire. But if me or you do a cartoon in a certain country and they kill us, some people think dying is destructive. Well, Swift compared satire to a mirror in which people could see every face but their own. Frank, Frank Zappa said, he's saying, watch the Nazis run your town. Now go home and check yourself. You think we're singing about somebody else. <laughs> so what's the function of satire? Yeah, that's a, those are very good points. I would never argue with the people like uh, Frank Zappa about satire. It's, uh, he's right on target. Uh, I yeah. think uh, um, it's a way to make fun of uh, others uh, without realizing we are part of that of that tribe. Yeah. 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 I saw him sing Broken Arts for Assholes in Las Vegas. And he's pointing at kids in the audience, go, you're an asshole, you're an asshole. And at one point he pointed at himself and he said, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so what's more important, conviction or compromise? Uh, if you ask me, conviction, that doesn't mean you shouldn't compromise. I would compromise on a lot of things to avoid uh, hard feelings. Uh, but I think conviction is important, yeah. You've accomplished a lot. In your accomplishments, how do you rate these three elements? Luck, skill, and ambition. What played the biggest role second and third? Correct. So by far luck, and I'm not, I don't agree on the premise that I accomplished a lot. But whatever happened in my life was definitely driven mostly by luck. It's, uh, it's an incredible. Imagine I came to the United States. I told you the truth. I accepted that job mainly because it was a chance to come to San Francisco. And guess yeah. what? The very first assignment they give me in this R&D lab is to make two computers communicate using something called ARPANET, and uh, the, the thing that, that was making the two computers communicate was a new program coming from Berkeley called email. I, I thought it was an incredibly stupid project. <laughs> what? It was the future of computing. <laughs> and, and guess what? This was 1983, so exactly 40 years ago, I can claim to be a pioneer. So for the next 10 years, I was an expert in this thing that eventually yeah. was called the internet and so on. So that's luck. Come on. So, but uh, but you you got, you could have got swooped into that world and changed. Are you happy? As I said, I don't think I, what I did in my life made me particularly happy. I didn't do it for happiness, and it didn't. But I mean, it. are you happy now? Are you right now? Are you happy? No, I'm not happy. Am I happy about what I did? I think it was inevitable. Uh, am yeah. I happy about? You know, the world around me, no, as I told you, I'm, I'm very worried about the world. So it doesn't yeah. make, so I, I didn't, that's why I didn't accomplish much. Yeah. Well, you brought up the word truth and Louis Bunuel said, I'm for anyone who seeks the truth, but I part ways when they claim they found it. Everybody goes, oh, that's great. And one person challenged me and says, that's bullshit. If I'm going to seek some, something, it's because I'm going to want to find it. So the cliche is the journey is more important than the destination. Why do we have to name or seek a destination if the journey is more important? Well, they're both important. I think that having a destination is important. And um, then whether you get to the destination, that's a, that's a different story. You know, you can take a thousand detours and find that, that there are better destinations. But 
you know, I personally wouldn't, I wouldn't overrate the journey. I wouldn't underestimate the destination. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree with the first thing that Bunuel said at the very beginning that, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm also suspicious of anybody who knows the truth. Yeah. It's uh, something that we, we, we seek humanity as a, as a whole, humankind as a whole over the centuries has been searching for the truth and uh, nobody has found it. I mean, Newton was wrong and Einstein is probably wrong. Somebody will prove him wrong in the future. So, yeah. so absolute truth definitely is, uh, is a chimera. Yeah, here's two I wa didn't want to pull out, but I have to. McLuhan said in 69, for James Joyce has solved numerous problems which science has not yet formulated as problems. <laughs> and then uh, Paul Veyne, a French historian, says science finds no truths. It discovers unknown facts that can be interpreted in a thousand ways. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, well, first of all, I, I, I am a scientist. I, I respect science, uh, but they're right. You know, yeah. so num number one, uh, there are still, uh, I mean, every scientist I know admits it. That we still mostly don't know. The, the amount of things we don't know uh, is overwhelming. Um, just just imagine, you probably heard of dark energy and dark matter, even without yeah. being a specialist. The yeah. two combined, we presume they form more than 90% of the universe, and we don't know where they are. So, yeah, I mean, it's so obvious at so many different levels. We still don't understand quantum mechanics. We still cannot, cannot uh, reconcile quantum mechanics with relativity. So, I mean, so the, the, the level of ignorance of uh, humankind is, is still uh, colossal. We are just searching and just searching. Yeah, Pierre. Really appreciate your <clears throat> even printing Captain Beefheart's name because he in so many ways is an important poet to me because one of his poems touches what you just said. The stars are matter, we are matter, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> so then the other thing is, you know, when... Captain Beefheart and Frank Zappa were talking at the end of their lives. They were both sort of about to pass away. They had both watched the PBS special on the Big Bang. And Frank asked Don, what do you think came before the Big Bang? And Don went, the big. <laughs> so Piero, T.S. Eliot said, poetry is outing our outing your inner dialogue what language is your inner dialogue in mm. maybe in symbols yeah just uh, abstract symbols that's good two of my film heroes george manupelli says ignore yourself Jonas Mika says, there is no self-expression. And jazz pianist Cecil Taylor says, I'm just a vehicle and this stuff just comes through me. Is art making more self-expression or more you're a vehicle for whatever technologies, cultures, and environments are dominant? Uh, both. I think uh, Cecil Taylor is right. <clears throat> um, I think Bach said something similar when he said I just play the notes. God makes the music. Um, <clears throat> um, it's this, uh, you know, art comes to you. At the same time, um, definitely our society, the society we humans create, determines what uh, what we can do and what we do. I mean, there's, there's a big difference between uh, <clears throat> The music that uh, Mozart and Beethoven were playing with the piano, and the music was played before the piano was invented. So, so I think it goes both ways. Can art making be egoless? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of art is egoless. Uh, I keep I keep telling people that uh, uh, I don't look down on uh, 
people or animals who don't consider themselves artists. They are not professional artists, but they do beautiful things. I can show you. I don't want to change to move the camera, but I have some things I bought on my in my trips that, in my opinion, are art. But the yeah. people making them, they were not making them as art. They were making them as useful things. One is a kitchen tool. Yeah. And uh, animals. I mean, come on. I've seen uh, <clears throat> spider webs. There was one. Where was it? Some some uh, Pacific island. It was this gigantic. A spider web and the first reaction was i don't want to meet the spider that made this thing <laughs> uh, but the second reaction was i took pictures my god this this is a work of art how yeah. many humans have produced something so beautiful so that's you know there's no the, the, there's no professional artist behind yeah. some of the most beautiful things i've seen put it this way that's one of McLuhan's favorite lines. The Balinese have no word for art. They do everything as well as they can. And, and this is true of a lot of artisans in the, in the old world. Yeah. Is perception reality? No. Uh, the simple answer is no. But of course, it depends how you define reality. Reality for us, yes. Reality for you, your perception is your reality. Meaning that uh, you know somehow <clears throat> what you see is what you will try, what will drive your actions. But is it the ultimate reality? Of course not. Yeah, Lily Tomlin says reality is just a collective hunch. So uh, Lewis Carroll said, "I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast." Have you believed in any impossible things lately? Um, I, I, I think a lot of the things I do are impossible. Like I would probably never finish or reading all the books that I have in me. And this is just a, a teeny fraction of the books I, I still have to read. Uh, I would probably never finish listening to all the good music there is out there. So, so, you know, you can say that, uh, <clears throat> um, hopefully we all have impossible goals. And we try to do as much as we can, knowing that we will not. I mean, think, think of parents. I don't have children, but I'm sure parents have an impossible, impossible mission of, of uh, creating, raising the best possible human beings. And yeah. That's clearly impossible. But you can try. Yep. Tell, tell me one major element of your creativeness that's changed in one major element that stayed the same in the years you've been being creative writing yeah i don't i don't know if this came uh, later in life that's the thing but definitely these days i realize a lot of what i do is just because i like adventure yeah and, uh, that is true in uh, the music i end up uh, reviewing the movies i end up watching the countries where i end up traveling even the hikes I do here in California, uh, there's always this uh, this element uh, of adventure, you know. So I'm not sure when, if it was already there when I was a child, but now definitely it's, it's the strongest motivation to do what I do. But that's what stayed the same. What has changed? Is there one major element you think has changed? No, I think there are many elements that I absorbed from reading, listening, and so on, that uh, each of them changed me a little bit, but yeah. I wouldn't know a big one. Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness. Tell me a weakness you turned into a strength. I wish I could think of one right away. No, I can think of many weaknesses I have, but I don't think I don't think I can turn them into strength. So fill in the so, blank. Ang that's all right. An fill in the blank. Anger can be a productive emotion when when it makes you think differently. Yeah. What's the most significant difference between men and women, physical aside? Uh, 
um, I don't know, but somehow I would trust women more than men in politics. But then I don't know how to define this feeling. Maybe because of the motherly thing. Maybe because, but I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure. What caused matriarchy? Matriarchy. Well, it was rare. Um, no, I don't know. Utah Phillips said, "Anarchy is making rules for yourself and not other people." Who's entitled to make the rules? Uh, well, Plato thought that only philosophers should be allowed. <clears throat> of course, he was a philosopher. Um, I tend to think that only uh, people are very competent should be allowed to make rules. But then, you know, I'm somebody who's always been a so <sighs> rebellious so hostile to rules who am i to talk about rules <laughs> what's the difference between rebellion and revolution uh so the 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 word that is difficult to define in my opinion is revolution rebellion again human brain does strange things and rebellion is typical of humans uh, each generation is different from the previous one that is not true of squirrels, cats, lions, uh, whales, and so on. We humans are the only ones that change our lifestyle with each generation. We are rebellious. It just comes with our brain. Revolution to me is something more, you know, something that, that uh, uh, bigger, something that uh, has uh, <clears throat> some kind of uh, cause and effect. So it's a little harder to define. When, when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, then nobody knows exactly when it started and when it ended. When you talk about uh, the French Revolution, you don't really know, you know exactly what it involved. So I think it's, uh, the revolution is, is, uh, is something that I find it harder, harder to define. Yeah. Sometimes I hear people say rebellion is when you know there's something wrong and you're reacting, revolution is you know there's something wrong and you have a new strategy or a new plan. So it's re-evolution, it's re-evolving. So what's the, what's the difference between rights and responsibilities? Well, the difference should be obvious. These are, these are two completely different things. I mean, uh, um, <clears throat> I think the, the rights are things uh, that you can do and responsibilities are, are, are things are much harder to define, much harder to realize. Um, I think a right comes with a responsibility. So I think a responsibility is the thing that is tricky. You know, it's easy to say, I have the right to do this it's a little harder to realize what responsibilities come with your actions. Much harder. Yeah. yeah. A few more and we're out of here. I really appreciate your time, Piero. This is um, John Basil Barnhill, years ago, a socialist. Where the people fear the government, you have tyranny. Where the government fears the people, you have liberty. V for Vendetta, the 2005 film paraphrase. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. How do you personally handle false fears like the war on drugs? You can't have a war on drugs because drugs don't fight and you can't say no to drugs because drugs don't talk or the war on terrorism or the war on poverty. How do you handle personally these false fears? You see, these are, these are very good examples of why Socrates was right. First, you need definitions. You know, yeah. so these things, I mean, war on drugs, what are you fighting exactly? Yeah. Um, so these are, these are very good examples where not only definitions, but semantics, what are the meanings of the word that you use? Yeah. Poverty, define poverty. I see yeah. a lot of people buying big homes and big cars, but they buy it on credit. So are they rich or poor? Uh, but, uh, 
I think it's uh, yeah. So the answer is we should really <clears throat> we should really spend more time thinking about what we're talking about. Yeah. Define define what you're talking about and then go from there. It's good thinking and defining it. Beautiful. <clears throat> There's a line that goes, you create what you resist. Bob Goldthwait, the comedian, morphed it into you are what you hate. James Joyce said, it's a curious thing how your mind is super saturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. And Louis Bunuel nailed it. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. So <laughs> any thoughts on this line, you create what you resist? I'm not saying you, but like one creates what one resists. Any thoughts on that line? I'm not sure if you create, uh, but definitely you are shaped. I think you are very much shaped about what you resist and what you don't like. I think we, we are shaped by the things we dislike more than by the things we like. If you ask people what is right right now in the United States, most people will hesitate. But yeah. if you ask them what you don't like, oh my God, what is wrong right now? Oh my God. So those are the things that shape your behavior. It's very good. How do you find peace of mind? Um, assuming that I ever found it, uh, it would be silence, isolation, yeah, being in a place where I'm not influenced by the, all the things that are happening around me. Yeah. These are five quick questions from Alan Watts, just off the top of your head in a couple words. One, who started it all? Big Bang. Are we going to make it? No. Where do we put it? Where do we put it? Mm, this is a little too abstract for me. Four, who's cleaning it up? Nature. Five, is it serious? Is it serious? Yeah. No. Okay. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? It's pointless. Did you hear me? I, I didn't hear it. Go ahead. Say it again. Oh. I said I said it's pointless. Oh, it's pointless. Okay, sorry. Yeah, you broke up a little there. Okay. Which way should toilet paper come off the roll? Over or under? Over. If a publisher was to release your autobiography off the top of your head, what would the title be? Um how not to live a life. They want to scent the glue in the binding. What smell? What smell? Uh, uh, bay leaves. Oh, I love that smell. That's a good smell. I never get that one. Very unique. If a statue was built in your honor, where would you want it displayed and what would it be made of? Uh, so I would like to have it displayed... Uh, um, in uh, in an ancient courtyard, let's say in Iran. Yep. And uh, <clears throat> actually, no, the Alhambra in uh, Spain. Okay. And made of what? I don't know. Made of some uh, natural material. Well, you know, stone. Stone. Tell me something good you never had and you never want never had uh, never want it's something that has to be good it's good never had it never want it yeah hmm I, I want to find something in the next five seconds Mm, 
can't come up with anything. Okay. Well, I'll tell you the answer I get the most. Fame, money, and heroin. <laughs> yeah, I could agree with fame, but I'm not sure it's good. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. Well, that's what people think, you know. Anyways, if you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? Oh, my God. Uh, laugh. Oh, that is a great answer. Tell, what is the cultural shift you see developing today that inspires you? Well, I don't know about the word inspire, but uh, the cultural shift is definitely uh, that in, it's the change in the humanities in academia. Everybody talks about the decline of the humanities, call it decline, call it change. But uh, that's definitely something that has a strong impact on me. How has writing shaped your behavior? Well, a lot, if nothing else, because I'm confined uh, in this little studio <clears throat> uh, for so many days when I don't travel. Uh, so it has definitely changed my behavior in a, a very uh, practical way. It has also changed the way I interact with people. Because um, I think there's a big difference if you first write things and then you talk to somebody than if you just talk to somebody. Yeah. It's good. In fact, Anthony Burgess said, we must now ask some very different questions about the relationship between music and life. What question remains unresolved for you in oh. general? In general. Uh, all of them. All of them. I, I would ask you which questions are, are, are resolved. Which? <laughs> yeah, that's good. This, you know, I... These are here, this is a world of questions. This is a world of unanswered questions. Yeah. Piero, I'll, I'll revert to um, or advance to John Cage. He would say, that's a very good question. I wouldn't want to ruin it with an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Two more and we're out of here, dude. This has really been fun and thank you. Thornton Wilder said in 1928, art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one's secret. It's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. You've laid your cards on the table for over 90 minutes. I'm not insinuating you haven't already answered this. What's it really all about for you? Uh, honestly, just uh, about knowledge. Yeah. And adventure. Adventure, now, adventure in knowledge. A knowledge and adventure. Those are two great words, man. Summed up well. What gives you the most optimism? <sighs> Maybe... Uh, it depends where I am, but sometimes younger generations, younger yeah. generations seem to be uh, less uh, suicidal than older people. But yeah. you know, then it depends. Always depends where I am. Yeah, it's very interesting because that's the answer I get the most hmm. on that question. And you know, the first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? Wilhelm Reich said the best thing for a human being is another human being. The last question, what gives you the most optimism is what they asked Groucho Marx at the end of his life. And he said, other people. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sure been fun spending this time with another person. Thank you so much. And thank you for all your writing. Indeed, it's really enlightening how many people you touch on in your website in your books hmm. and we we could do hours and hours <laughs> on some of these people like janine marsuchet john law you know they both i both asked them all these questions and uh anyone who 
I think I learned of you through Christian Marclay, who I really want to uh, interview. You have any connections with him? Because I'd love to interview him. No, I just, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a direct connection. I wrote about him. I, I was at um, some of, the, of his shows, so that's it. Have you seen the clock, his 24 yes. hours? You've seen yeah. the, how many hours of it? I don't remember. A couple of um, hours, maybe. Couple, yeah, a couple hours. And then 11 years ago on your channel, you did something on Kurt Schwitters, who is, again, another hero. So, Yeah, then, it's, a, it's a centennial of something he built, some very strange building he built. Um, great guy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure and an honor. I hit the podcast button. I hope this never ends and we can keep talking forever and ever. Sure. I'm uh, honored and thank you for familiarizing me with so many quotes. Very interesting quotes. Thank you. Thank you.